Uh, if you don't know Pastor Brian, then it, I want to tell you it's impossible to really introduce him. You don't, you don't introduce Pastor Brian Simmons. You just kind of unleash him. <laughs> Praise the Lord, because he's full of the fire and the presence of the Lord tonight. Pastor Brian is a church planter. He's a linguist, a Bible translator. He and his wife, Candice, have planted churches and all kinds of works. They have called the church in our region and around the nation to prayer. Right now, he's in the midst of a very uh, powerful and significant Bible translation project that I'm sure he's going to tell you about. So uh, let's get him up here quick to share what God has laid out his heart tonight. I want you to stand and give your best welcome for our friend, Pastor Brian Simmons. Oh, thank you guys. Isn't Jesus sweet? Oh, my, you don't hear men use that word very often. Come on, Jesus is sweet. Sweet are his kisses, sweeter than wine. Sweeter than wine is his love. Smother me, smother me, smother me with your kisses. Come on, you need some of this tonight. You look like you've been the cover page to the book of Lamentations. Go ahead and sit down and cheer up a little bit. We're going to just pray for a little bit. I, I'm going to ask the worship team to... Man, I just love you, brother. You're just amazing. What a gift from God you are. All of you, actually. All of you. Thank you. Uh, what all languages do you speak? You speak Malaysian? I can say Kuala Lumpur. What... Tell us, uh, let's, let's, I'll tell you what, can you, you pray, right? You pray in Malaysian? A bit. Well, the lead, what's the name for God? Tuhan. Tuhan. Let's pray, you and me. And they, they're invited too, okay? Tuhan, let your Holy Spirit fall upon us. Tuhan, biar roh kudus. We're desperate for you. Kami terlampau mahu Tuhan. Our hearts crave you. Hati kami, hati kami hendak Tuhan. We want the Father's embrace. Kami nak Bapa punya embrace. Oh, Papa embrace. Give us Papa embrace. Hmm. What's the word for kiss? Chiom. Oh. Would you say that to God, though? I mean, okay. What was the word for God? <laughs> Tuhan. Chiom, Tuhan. Father, kiss. Yo, kiss my heart. Kiss my heart. Uh, Tuhan. Uh, okay, yeah. Tuhan, cinta la hati kami. Isn't that good? All right, close your eyes. Let's pray just a little bit. Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Uh, I got a word from a prophet today. Got a hold of me. He said if we would pray before the meeting, that the, the entire atmosphere would change. The Lord told him that. Amen. Isn't that amazing? You know, I don't care if I hear me tonight. I want to pray to God tonight. I want God to show up. I mean, I can get boring sometimes. But he never is. Father, Appa, Aboji in Korean. Aboji, is it you speak Korean? No? Any Koreans here? Señor Todopoderoso, pedimos tu gran poder. Santificado sea, Señor. Father, we pray. Come on, let's get in the spirit. Father, we ask you, split open the sky over Harvest Time Church tonight. Just pull it back to the right and to the left like you split the Red Sea. Split open the sky. There it is. Split open the sky and, and bring the breakthrough that every single person in this room is longing for. In our families, in our finances, in our health, in our careers. Lord, with our destinies that we've not missed one day. Life is so short and so uh, empty. If we, if we lose you, Lord, if we miss you, so come, Lord. We don't want to miss one day. We want every throbbing heartbeat to be for you, Lord. So we pray that you would overshadow us like you did with Mary. And like you did on the Mount of Transfiguration, come and overshadow us tonight, Lord. Blow away depression, discouragement, despair, every 
defeatism, every mentality of victim mentality of, of not rising up to that high place with you. Lord, crush beneath our feet tonight the enemy and every plan to slow us down, to hinder our advance, to allure us into some cul-de-sac, into some detour away from our ultimate destiny. We ask, Lord, that you would pierce our darkness, pierce our hearts with truth tonight. Come and pierce our ear, open our ears, that we would be those who are being taught of the Lord. We lay our heart before you, even if it's in pieces, we lay our hearts before you, God. And we wait for your fire to fall upon our hearts. We want to be living ones, flaming ones, burning ones, loving ones, tender ones to you, God. We gave up religious duties and the yoke of bondage, the legalistic oppression of religion. We gave that up years ago. We're here, Lord, because we long for you like, like a, a hunted deer craves a drink of water from the refreshing brooks. We long for a drink of you, Holy Spirit, Holy One, Holy God. I pray that everyone in this room would feel the strong arms of heaven around us. Heaven's strength, the Father's love, the perfect love of a perfect Father. Remove fatherlessness from our hearts, God. Remove isolation, loneliness, abandonment, the orphaned mentality, the victim mentality. Lift it from our hearts forever, God, that we would always see ourselves as connected eternally to the three in one. We love you, Lord. Abba, we love you. Jesus Christ, we love you. Isa, we love you. Espiritu Santo, Holy Spirit. Song Yong Nim, we love you. Dobo Rosta Paraba Rota. Briska Poroda de Kiata. We love you, God. We love you, Father. Everybody say, I am loved by a perfect father. I have the best dad in the whole world. He's a perfect father. And he has perfect love that casts out fear. I am full and complete. I am filled with the love of a perfect father. Tell the person next to you, you are loved by a perfect father. I want to thank Pastor Nick and all of the team here, Pastor Glenn and Denise and their lovely family. I miss them. I hope I can see them uh, Sunday before we take off. I think they're coming back. hope so. Uh, but I'm so glad that I can be here with you and my wife will reappear any moment. She was transported while you prayed. She was lifted up and she will return. The entire atmosphere of the room will change when she comes into the room. You'll know she's here. God showed off when he made her. You know, he made Adam and Eve, made Eve, and he said, I can do better than that. And he made Candace not too many years ago <laughs> to prove it. And please tell her I said that when you see her. <laughs> I want to speak tonight about a need you have. And it's a need that every single person in this room has. Whether you're a pastor, priest, bishop, pope. Whether you are male or female, young or old. Every single person in this room, don't look now, but the person next to you really has this need in their heart. Don't look at them. You have it too, to be loved by a father. I want to share with you about a father's love. Last night we had flames of fire. We talked about passion. We talked about that God's heart for us would, that, would be that we would become living flames, messengers of fire, that we get off our couches of Laodicea and we burn with first love passion for Jesus. Tonight, I want to share with you a, a teaching that I believe can really touch every man in this room. And I'm really directing this to the men. I'm going to ask the women to forgive me. I have a feeling it's going to overflow on all of our, our wonderful sisters that are here. But I'm going to speak right into the male heart. And I want the men 
to, uh, you know, stay awake. And I want you to hear this. Because it's about time you came back home to the father you've always wanted. You see, ever since Adam and Eve were created, they were alienated from God the Father in the Garden of Eden, and an orphan spirit permeated the earth. I hesitate to use the word orphan, and I'm going to qualify it simply by saying I think it's overdone and overused. And I'm not projecting it on anybody. And if you are fully mature as a son of the living God, then you can take a nap. But I do believe that the orphan mentality of isolated, being alone, that nobody understands, nobody really cares, and that sense of distance between you and a perfect father, that it keeps us from becoming the mature son, daughter, that God has wanted to populate the earth with. Almost immediately after the fall, the pernicious signs of evil began to show up in the hearts of men. There was only a few of them. And uh, Cain murdered his brother. The first son of Adam and Eve became a murderer. Think that one over. And you know why he murdered his brother? One word, jealous, because the father did not accept Cain's sacrifice. And that orphan mentality of being rejected by the father has been passed down through uh, every ethnicity and every uh, gender and every generation of human existence until the cross of Jesus Christ came. And I just recently translated John 17, and, and I just love that chapter where Jesus says, Father, show them your love, that the same love you have for me, you have for them. You see, a father's love is the only thing that's going to break the hindrance to your life and move you into the fullness of your sonship or daughtership, if, I, if you'll allow me to say that. I believe that all emotional, physical, and spiritual ills of society can be traced back to humans feeling alienated from Father God and even from their biological fathers. Orphan men have the hardest time connecting to their spouses and children. They're the ones that become alcoholics, abusers, and uh, fill the uh, prisons and jails and the penal systems of our land. You heard the story, it's a true story, about Mother's Day that Hallmark, thank God for Hallmark cards, it saves all of us men from having to write out our own thoughts and we can just, you know, cut and paste and use the card. But anyway, Hallmark decided as a charitable deed that they would give to a certain prison cases of Mother's Day cards. And those Mother Day cards were, were just, you know, every one of them was taken by the prisoners and they filled them out and uh, sent them on their Mother's Day uh, to their moms. And the next year rolled around and they thought Father's Day they would do the same thing. So they sent the same amount of cases of Father's Day cards. Not one was taken. All these full boxes of Father's Day cards and not one of the prisoners took one of them. I'll let you do the math on that. Sadly, there are churches filled with pastors and leaders who have used people to destroy relationships because they're driven to succeed. The ambition of men oftentimes can be rooted back. The competition of men can oftentimes be rooted back to trying to succeed and get their father's approval. Still with me? There's a hole too large for anything else to fill. Ministry, success, money, uh, passing from one relationship to another, jumping from one relationship to another. None of those things for a woman's heart or a male heart could fill that need of a father. The only way to break the orphan spirit is for you and I to be filled with a sense of the father's love. This is why I want to talk about the father's love tonight. Don't look now, but you need it. I don't really care. I mean, I care, but it, it's irrelevant, irrespective of how wonderful your father was, is, or is not, or was not. I hope I said that right. Irrespective of how you were fathered, uh, there is still a need for a father's love inside of your heart tonight. And it's only when a person is healed of this fatherlessness and we get God out of our heads and into the spirit where undeserved grace kisses us and we feel the warmth, the embrace, the tenderness, the passion, the love, the burning flow of the Father's life and the Father's love through us. It's only then that this 
mentality of being orphaned, of being alone, isolated, abandoned, however we could phrase it in English. The orphan spirit. The only way that's broken is when the Father's love fills us. And I believe that sonship is so important that all of creation is actively uh, travailing and engaged in, in, in travail for the sons of God to be manifest. When Satan came to Jesus in his temptation, he didn't say, if you're a miracle worker, he didn't say, if you're an apostle, if you're a good man, he said, if you're the son of God, if you're the father's son, if you're really a son, turn this stone into bread. You see, all of Satan's activity on earth is to rob you of sonship, to, to threaten and to, and to tempt you to move away from the place of strength and security in the Father's love. And if he can get you to do that, then you will try, uh, you, will, you will get loose to try to find other ways to fill that heart, to fill the heart need. But when you know securely that you are the Father's favorite one, <laughs> yeah, that's what I said, that you're the Father's favorite one. Didn't the Father say from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in Him I am well pleased? Aren't you in Him? Then He's well pleased with you. End of story. You're His favorite. He loves you with the same love He has Jesus. He doesn't love Jesus one bit more than He loves you. Somebody's going to like this tonight. You are loved by a perfect Father. You have a perfect Father with perfect love wrapping Himself around you. This really helps an inferiority complex. This really helps the lust to succeed and to become somebody and to use the church and ministry as illegitimate ways to get people's approval and hopefully dad's in heaven someday. But instead, we're, we, we have it fully already in Jesus Christ. Well, I want to talk to you tonight about your hero. Your hero is the prodigal father. Now, I was talking with my wife, and, and uh, she admitted she didn't know what the word prodigal meant. So uh, I explained to her what the word prodigal. Do you know what prodigal means? Prodigal means excessive, lavished, more than the normal, extravagant, profusely generous, uh, just giving, 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 giving until there's nothing left to give. That's prodigal. Sadly, there is in the Bible a parable that has been misnamed as the prodigal son. You know where that's at, Luke 15. You can turn there if you want. And if you don't, that's okay. I'm going to read it in the brand new translation for you. But the prodigal son is a misnomer. It is a misnamed parable because the son is not the picture of that story. It's the father. It's the father's love. It's the father's heart. And the word prodigal should be attached to the father. He's the excessively generous, like crazy, wild, extravagant in how he blesses unworthy, uh, at times undeserving, uh, all the time, undeserving human beings. Everybody say, I have a prodigal father. He's the extravagant lover of the hearts of men. Where do you think love came from? Where do you think passion stems from it's from his heart and he made you in his image therefore he put in you the capacity to love like God well this prodigal father he proves in the parable that he is patient here's the ten revelations of the prodigal father he's patient he's waiting he's compassionate he's running to embrace you he's affectionate he's intimate he's forgiving he's accepting he's extravagant and he throws a party when you come home he's re he just celebrates baby I mean he invented celebration ooh, ooh, he loves it and the, t the day that we take the joy and celebration out of the house out of the church I'm out of here. It's a little dull and boring. We need the joy of the Lord to be strength to us. We don't need to be cover pages, cover pictures for the book of Lamentation. You know, that's your Facebook picture. No, we have a Father. We have a happy God. We got a, a God that celebrates and He longs to bless us. He wakes up early in the morning. He doesn't sleep. But He, he rises early to bless you, it says. 
he, he thinks about you. If he ever went on vacation, it'd be ruined because he thinks about you all the time. I mean, he's constantly holding you. You know, it's like a nail print in his hand. He'll never forget it. He'll never forget you. A nursing mother could forget her child, but I will never forget you, says the Lord. Never. I have plans for you. I have a destiny for you. I have a vision and a dream for you. And it's to bless you that all of the goodness of my heart would come to pass inside of you. That you would get the transfer of my grace and glory in its fullness into your mentality, into your, your daily routine, into your, your, your uh, way of thinking. You've got a wonderful dad. You've got a wonderful father. You don't ever have to worry about his love. You don't ever have to worry about him loving you. Every one, of you, every one of us have a deficit in our heart. But it's when the love of the Father comes to us that that deficit is fulfilled. I'm going to read uh, uh, most of the prodigal father's parable here out of the Passion Translation. Luke, uh, we have, happen to have, just happen to have some there in the back for you to uh, uh, purchase. They're only $1,000 a piece. But tonight, special, there's a discounted price that I forgot exactly what it is, but Peg will help you after the end of the meeting. But it's really worth $1,000. But discounted price for you here in this house tonight. Once there was a father with two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think that it's time to give me the share of your estate that belongs to me? So the father went ahead and distributed among his two sons their inheritance. Shortly afterwards, the younger son packed up all his belongings and traveled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far-off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. Now with everything spent and nothing left, he soon grew hungry, for there was a severe famine in that land. So he begged a farmer in that country to hire him. And the farmer hired him and sent him out to feed pigs. The hungry son was so famished that he was willing to even eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated, the son finally realized what he was doing. And he thought to himself, there are so many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? I will go back home to my father's house and I'll say to him, Father, I was so wrong. I have sinned against you. I'll never be worthy to be called your son again. Please, Father, just treat me like you would treat an employee. So the young son set off for home to his father's house. But from a long distance away, his father saw him coming dressed as a beggar. And great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. So the father ran out to meet him. The father ran out to meet him. He swept him up in his arms, hugged him closely, kissed him over and over with tender love. Then the son spoke up. Through his tears, he said, Father, I was so wrong. I've sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me, but the father interrupted and said, son, you're home now. Turning to his servants, the father said, quick, bring me the robe, the splendid robe of favor. Place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring 
the seal of sonship and put it on his finger. The seal of sonship. And bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. Prepare a great feast. Let's celebrate. For this beloved son of mine was once dead, but now he's alive again. Once he was lost, but now he's found. And everyone began to celebrate with overflowing joy. Four things every child wants from a father. Everyone in this room, you crave this. Every boy, every girl, and I'm going to talk to you for a quick second like a boy or a girl because that's what you are. Every precious daughter in this room, listen to me. This is what you crave. Every wonderful young man, every boy in this room, listen to me. This is what every man, every male heart craves to have. Number one, acceptance. In Jesus Christ, we are accepted. A son wants to be accepted by the father. A daughter wants to know the Father accepts her, that there's no alienation, there's no, nothing to prove. Accepted not because you do something, but because you are someone in His eyes. After all, we are human beings, not human doings. The second thing every daughter and every son longs for is focused attention. Focused attention. To know that your father hears you. That he cares about your story. He'll hear your cry. You come home from school and he's there to hear your story. I'll never forget in the jungle when my wife and I were uh, working with indigenous people groups. And we were uh, just beginning our ministry of learning the language and you know it, it's crazy hot and we had no air conditioning no electricity no diet Pepsi or, or Snickers candy bars and there we were suffering <coughs> in the jungle and um, we had people in our hut every day I mean constantly uh, this you're gonna think I'm exaggerating but God knows, and of course my wife knows, and when she reappears, she will here any, any second. But we, for about eight years, I could count on one hand, in eight years, the times in the jungle that we had a meal to ourselves. We constantly had people watching us, looking through the bark walls, and every meal we had it would go through the whole village what we ate that day. It's like we became the Simpsons. I don't know. We became their entertainment. And we constantly had people there. And our little son, David, who was born while we were missionaries there in the tribe, now he's 30 and single <laughs> and very handsome. Talk to me later. But while he was a toddler there in the jungle, I'll never forget as long as I live. I we were like turned and tossed constantly. People would come and ask us for salt. They would come and ask us for a, a machete to borrow or a file to sharpen their machete so they could work in the jungle. And, and we we're constantly activity in our house. And here's our little son who kept saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. I didn't even know he was asking me. And then finally, he slapped my face, and he said, Daddy, I want a cookie. <laughs> he got my attention. And I realized, as I held him in my lap, he needed some focused attention. I was giving it away to all of the people, but he needed, my son needed that focused attention. I want you to know you don't have to slap God's face. You don't have to shout, I'm over here, God, even though it feels like it at times. The Father knows every whisper, every cry of your heart. And in the Passion Translation of the Psalms, uh, one of the verses, uh, is it 39.8 or 38.9? One In Psalms, it says, uh, Lord, my tears are liquid words, and you read them all. 
He knows the sighing. He knows the thought before it's even in our heart. And of course He hears our prayers. Of course He knows what we long for, what we want as we pray for our family, we pray for our nation, we pray for those we love. He hears our cry. I don't care what you've been told by the one covered with sulfur. God hears your cry. You have focused attention. The third is guidance. Every daughter, every son wants the Father's guidance. We want to be led. We want God to show us what path. We want to be directed. We want someone to take our hand through life, get us through the sorrows, the pain, the difficulties, the pressures, the tensions. When we're at our worst, would you, even then He would take our hand and show us the right path. I'm telling you, the Father, the perfect Father who loves you with perfect love, He will guide you with His eyes. He will guide you with His heart. He will lead you even through the darkest valley of the shadows of death. Even there, He will take you by the hand and lead you to the other side. God will be with you to the end. I will be with you. When everyone else walks out, I stay there. I'm with you. When you wish you had someone to speak to, to ask questions, to help you with. And I know of people in this room, your father is not even alive today. He's passed on. And I know that the, there are adult orphans, older orphans when your parents pass away. But that need is still there. I love the fact that Psalm 25 is in my Bible. I love that psalm. I read it many times. It strengthens me. It comforts me. The Lord is our guide, our protector. He leads us through life. He takes us by the hand. You've all seen the picture of a father with a little boy or a little girl. Got her hand raised up really high, and the father takes the little girl's hand. And you see the picture from the backside as they walk down this beautiful forest trail. I don't know. But the... the, the emotion of that, the image of that is, is that a father takes the child by the hand and leads them through life. I want you to know the father is leading you. You are not an accident. Your life is not uh, just a, a, a bundle of spontaneity. God has planned a destiny for you. You are the poetry of God. Ephesians 2.10 says that you are His workmanship or craftsmanship. The Greek word is poema. You know what that sounds like. The poema. How does it feel to be the poema of God? You are the poetry of God. You are divine poetry. There's rhyme, rhythm, meter. The lyrics are going to fit. God's going to make sure that your poetic life, the expression of who you are, that it's completed. And you're a comedy, not a tragedy. God writes beautiful poetry, and it's you. Tell the person next to you, even if you don't like them, you are the beautiful poetry of God. The fourth thing, the fourth thing that every daughter, listen to me, precious ones, Listen to me, girls. Every daughter wants this from a father. And men, listen to me, boys. Every man wants this from a father. Protection. We look to our father to protect us. We look to a dad to be a hero. Every girl deserves to have a hero. It's called daddy. Every boy deserves to have a hero. It's called your dad. And on the playground in my grammar school, you better not say anything about my dad. I'd give you black eye. My dad could whoop your dad any day of the week. And we, we grow up with that God, you know, induced thought because he wants us to have a hero and a father. And I want you to know you have a hero. You have the greatest hero of all. There's never been a God 
There's never been a father like him. There's never been one who watches over his sons to protect them from their future failures. Yes, God will even protect you from the fall that the devil wants you to have a year from now, five years from now, a decade from now. But he protects you. He orders your path. I'm convinced you do not have a guardian angel. You have a, a, an army of angels around you. Some of us require that much activity because we're kind of high maintenance to God. The way we drive, you know. And they're not in the outfield or backfield. They're with us. The angelic presence. God dispatches these angels to watch over us so that we will not be hurt. Because a father will always make sure his sons and daughters are cared for. I think you can see where I'm going with all this, folks. That when you understand that you're a son of a loving father, that you're the daughter of the most loving father, you live different. You put shock absorbers on your life, on your heart. You go over the speed bumps. You go over those, those potholes. You, you can navigate through life knowing that every problem doesn't mean God left you. Every difficulty does not mean that God has abandoned you or surrendered you to your enemies, but that He's there to protect, to heal, to accept, to embrace, to listen intently to every word and sigh of your heart. And He's going to break through for you. Our God is the breaker, the one who breaks open the way. And if you want to really know how wonderful your Father is, look at the gift He gave you in Jesus Christ. He gave heaven's best. He gave His unique Son. The words only begotten are a, not a good translation of those words in, in Greek and Aramaic. The best way to translate that is that His one and only, His unique Son. There's no one like Jesus Christ. He gave you the most prized, treasured, cherished possession of heaven. What's heaven without Jesus? He gave that treasure to you. And now we carry it within us. Christ is in us every single moment as the, as the testimony of a father who loves his sons and daughters. Don't be scared, but I've got eight more points. We're going to go through them quick. But I want to tell you before we pray, and I think something very unusual is going to happen tonight as I pray. I want to talk about the spirit of sonship, what it looks like. Here's the eight things a spirit of sonship will look like. First of all, we won't operate out of insecurity and jealousy. The spirit of sonship will function out of love and acceptance. Those with an orphan spirit are constantly battling jealousy and insecurity because security originates in a secure relationship. And if you do not feel your relationship with Father God is secure, then you are insecure. They have a hard time, uh, those with an orphan spirit will have a hard time hearing a biological or a spiritual father praise them. There are certain people that cannot handle praise. And that's an issue that often indicates an insecurity and an orphan spirit. Second, we won't be jealous of the success of our brothers. If God accepts, blesses, praises, anoints, lifts up, exalts, and makes famous, our own sibling, we can be happy. And we don't, there's enough to go around. See, an orphan never has enough, so you got to kind of hoard and hide everything. you got to put it in your pocket, take it home with you, because you'll go hungry. But when that spirit of sonship is on our heart, there's enough to go around. Like, how many billions of people does he love this way? And he won't love us less if, if we see him bless somebody else. A mature son will be committed to the success of others. Those with an orphan spirit are secretly happy when a brother fails because it makes them feel good about themselves. But those with the spirit of sonship will joyfully commit themselves to serve and celebrate the exaltation of another when someone else succeeds. And when others are praised, we don't secretly feel like we deserved it, but we celebrate that they received it. Third, Spirit of sonship won't serve God to earn the Father's favor or the Father's love. A mature son serves God out of a sense of acceptance and favor. 
The orphan spirit is constantly striving and trying to earn the Father's love, to accomplish in ministry, business, and in a multitude of careers. Those with the spirit of sonship already know they're accepted in Christ. They serve others because of an abundance that overflows towards them. Can you imagine being so full that people around you feel accepted by the Father because it's overflowing from you? Instead of sucking it out of the room and pulling it illegitimately out of everybody's around you as we fish for compliments and hope to be received and hope to be accepted, instead we become a fountain, a well of acceptance, favor, love, and blessing. Here, take more. I got enough to spare. I have an endless supply. I'm living under the fountain of glory. The Lord told me the other day, He says, it doesn't matter how many holes your cup has if you put it under a waterfall. If you put it in the right place, it doesn't matter if you leak. You got a source. You got a supply. It's never going to run dry. I'm going to get poetic here. Fourth, we won't be driven by the need for success. The Holy Spirit leads mature sons into our calling, into our mission, not the illegitimate drive for success and significance. How men need to hear this. Many attempt to accomplish great things because they want to satisfy the deep yearning for their father's approval. It results in them being driven to succeed instead of being led by the Spirit. Even many leaders get churches into huge debt, build huge buildings, not this one, of course, but driving the people around them because they're blinded by their own inadequacies and feelings of weakness. Only those with a strong sense of sonship will allow the Lord to direct them and bring opportunity to them without drumming up their own success. Number five, we won't use people with the spirit of sonship flowing in our life. People are never objects that we use to fulfill our goals, but rather mature sons and daughters serve people to bless them with kingdom life and kingdom expression. Whenever we objectify people, we manipulate them. Words, threats, the fear of rejection. Those are all carnal weapons that we laid aside when we came to know Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We no longer wage war with the weapons of fear, control, manipulation, and the fear of I won't accept you if you don't do this. But those walking in sonship will never use people. They will serve and release others to fulfill their destiny and find their greatest joy when others succeed. Number six, we will abandon anger and fits of rage, which I believe are always rooted in the insecurity of an orphan spirit. I'm saying all this fast. You may want to get the, the, the podcast or whatever and listen to it again, but the uncontrollable anger, fits of rage, and all forms of manipulation in relationships are rooted in the sense of, of, of feeling like we have to control and fulfill our goals since we lack faith and the trust that is necessary in the Father to fulfill His dream and to lead our lives into pleasant paths. And if we don't have that relationship with the Father, then we will try it on our own. Let me tell you, my friend, the Father has the future in your hands. In his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. And he's got you and your future and your destiny. He has it in his hands. You are not going to be the first human being ever in all of creation that he's going to fail. It doesn't look good on his resume. He's not going to let it happen. He will succeed with you. You will reach your desired end. You will come to that haven. You will come to that destiny. I'm telling you, don't try illegitimately to crawl up some other way. Thieves and robbers do that. Number seven, we'll no longer be in competition. This would probably ruin ESPN, but anyway. The spirit of sonship is always... Blessing, not competing. It's immature sons that compare and compete. To compare and compete is a mark of insecurity and a fatherlessness of our hearts. The orphaned spirit 
has to compete to get more, has to compare. And when we see somebody with a little bit more, we got to go and, and grab the morsel from their table and take it to ourselves. But when you are the son of the prodigal father, there's an extravagance. There's, a, a, there's such an opulence. There's such a, a, a totality of, of blessing over us. It's a realm. It isn't just a blessing. It's a realm of blessing. It's called out of his riches. It's according to the riches. I mean, you heard the story about Alexander the Great walked by a homeless man begging for money. Alexander the Great took gold coins out of his pocket and threw it at the feet of the beggar. And his attendant said to him, but sir, copper coins would have satisfied the beggar. Why did you not give copper coins to this beggar? Alexander the Great said copper coins would suit his need. But Alexander's need for giving is only suited by gold coins. See, the Father has, He doesn't get poorer when He blesses you. He doesn't diminish. It's an endless supply. It's a self-replenishing resource of glory, riches, treasures, and infinite love that has inexhaustible dimensions to it. You can never fathom it. It's beyond logic. It's outside. It's transcendent in every way. And the extravagance of the prodigal father, you don't have to snatch it from somebody else to get your crumb. You've got the master card for eternity. Let's finish with this. The eighth is the spirit of sonship knows our true identity. Everybody say, I'm the son of a living God. If you're a woman, I want you to say, I'm the daughter of a living God. I'm the son of the living God. How does that make you feel? That's better than Mufasa. To, to know... To know that you are enriched, that you don't have to go and beg for your inheritance. Oh, are you kidding? It's like my grandkids begging me. Are you kidding? You want a 50 or a 100? I go see my grandkids. I purposely put $100 bill, $20 bills, $50 bills in my billfold. I know what's coming. And I know my kids are going to be the same way because I raised them that way when they become grandparents. Spirit of sonship knows your identity. You walk in love and acceptance. There's those with an orphan spirit will have a hard time receiving love. It's like hugging a two by four. They're so stiff, they don't want it. No way. I'm shut down, don't you know? My emotions are frozen, don't you realize? I've been wounded, I've been hurt. Can I say who cares? We all have. If you want to swap stories, then uh, we're going to be here long. But instead, we get our hearts filled and, and overflowing and complete because we know that we're sons, we're daughters. I think this message hits everybody at a different level. I think some of you, you crave it. Others convinced you have it. And some still are going to think about it. But beloved ones, you are loved by a perfect father and only perfect love casts out insecurity, which shows itself in fear. But the perfect love of a father, when it wraps itself around you, <laughs> you I'm telling you, Zippity is back in your doodah. You have, you have something so incredible. People stop you and say, what's happening to you? You just get married or engaged or something? I say, are you kidding? Look at me. I'm happily married. But there's something immensely powerful that takes place in our heart. 
when you can just say, Daddy loves me, this I know. And you got enough to spare. Here, you want some? You want some tonight? Come and get some. I'll give you some. The love of God. My cup, it may have a hole or two in it. It doesn't take a, you know, real spiritual prophet to discern that. But, it, you know, I, I don't care. I'm not going to talk about the holes in my cup anymore. I'm just going to put my bucket under the fountain, the glory spout, until all the evil comes out of me. And as I get drenched under the Niagara Falls of His love, and as we get washed and washed and washed by the water of His Word, which is 1 Corinthians 13, love, as we get washed by that loving Word, we're transformed. I've never met one Christian too encouraged. I've never met one Christian that was so loved they couldn't take any more. I've never met one that told me, stop. I'm so secure already, I don't need another kiss from God. No, I'm telling you, you're wired for this. You are wired as a human being. The Holy Spirit has tenderized you and made you want these words of love and affirmation. I don't know what your love language is, but God told me what His is. He said, you're my love language. That's what He told me. I like that. You see, I kind of enjoy the love of God. I rely upon it. I experience it and enjoy it. Is that okay? You're going to get jealous? I mean, I could tell you a bunch of stuff. Do a little jealous test here. But I'm telling you, I'm His favorite. I'm blessed up one side, down the other. I'm crowned, robed, and throned. I'm filled with every spiritual gift. I come behind and lack no good thing. I've been blessed before I even need something. It's there. I have the most wonderful wife, a beautiful family. I have friends like right here in this house. I love this place. I'm telling you, I'm just blessed. And you want to tell me about what you don't have and how you lack this and how this has happened and how you don't have this and you don't have that? You need to hang out with me more. You need to come buy Starbucks for me or something. We'll go caffeinate ourselves. <laughs> Honestly, you, there, there's nothing, nothing, nothing you lack in the Father's love. Thank you, Lord. I told you she'd materialize. How you doing? You miss me? See, she did. Love makes the world go round. Love is what it's all about. You say, oh, Brian, you, you get on Facebook and you put all those lovey-dovey things on Facebook and it's all the love of God and grace and kiss and mercy and God loves us. Yeah. <laughs> Guilty. Well, you need to warn everybody and tell them about hell and what's coming. <laughs> Hell's not coming for me. I got set free from hell. I got delivered from hell. Oh, but you got to tell them that if, if, if they take love too far, they're going to do bad things. No, they're probably going to get healed. They're going to get loved and embraced and filled and warmed. And, and then suddenly they have enough to give away and they start spreading. Let me tell you, it's a love revival that's coming, baby. This is the bride's revival. This is an awakening of the love of God coming to the nations. Yes, judgment's coming. Yes, I've read the Bible. Don't go there with me. But the love of God is what protects, heals, seals us like a burning seal over our heart that protects us from all the evil. I want the mark of the Christ. I'm not worried about the mark of the beast. I want the mark of the Christ on my life. And when we're locked in His love and we're sealed tight with the seven seals of the love of God. There's seven of them. I forgot what they are. They're in my notes somewhere. Oh, there's seven seals, seal of approval, seal of acceptance, seal of redemption. They're all there in the Bible. We're sealed, man. We're, we're, we're preserved until the coming of the day of God. We're, we're, our, our bodies are going to reflect someday the glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lula. We're going to get transformed from the inside out, transfigured. One day we're going to lay aside our jar of clay, and we're going to look face to face to the one we love. 
And we're not going to think about the pain. We're not going to think about, well, Daddy didn't love me and I didn't, I didn't have any money growing up. Who cares? you got all that you need right now. So let heaven come. Let heaven come into your heart right now. Let the Father's love wash over you. Go ahead and stand and receive it tonight. Just let the Father's love come upon you. Oh, you need this. Don't look at the person next to you because they're probably crying. But they need it. You need it. Everybody under 100, you need this. You need this. So I want you to prophesy. I want you to sing out the Father's love. I want you to just sing. She'll help you. We got a good team up here. I want you just to be the voice of the Father right now. And wash over us. Close your eyes, peeps. Close your eyes. And... and and, and wash over us with the words of the Father's love. I love you with an everlasting love. I've carried you in my heart from, the, from before you were born. I love everything about you. I'm your Father. I'm your perfect Father. Father, lift your hands up and say, Father, come on, you're his son, you're his daughter. This is who you really are. You're one of his, his favorite one, his chosen one. Yeah, you're at the front of the line to be blessed. Mm, yeah, here we go. Come on. Yeah. Every thought I see 
each tear that falls, and he hears me when you call. I want all the men to come down real quick. All the men. All the men. Come on, bros. Come and join me, man. Yeah. God's about to do something in your heart tonight. Yeah. Thank you, God. Close your eyes for a second, men. You're in a safe place. I just want to prophesy over you. The Lord is saying, I saw you when you were a young boy. I took special delight in you from the day you were born. I myself watched over your upbringing. I saw you when you took your first step. I was there watching and participating with you as you took that giant leap into grammar school. As you walked through those years of your schooling into middle school, high school, college, I was there. I found unusual joy even in your weak moments. I saw who you really are. I filtered through with my eyes of love. I filtered out what you call your problems and I saw my son my beautiful son my wonderful son my beloved son and I am coming to you tonight in a way you did not expect you did not come into this building tonight expecting to bump into the father but I am here tonight as your father And I break off of your life from this night forward the feeling that you don't measure up, that you were not good enough. Rejection, isolation, even the painful loneliness that you have endured, I lift it off of you tonight and forevermore. And I bring to you the sweet message of my prodigal love for I am the prodigal father and I will love you beyond your weakness for did not I say that I loved my disciples even unto the end for I will love you to the end of your need to the end of your pain and I will love you to the end of your days on earth and I will welcome you one day into my courts my radiated, glorified, beautiful son. And I will place upon you what the prodigal father put upon the son who returned. I will place upon you a robe of splendor and glory worn only by the sons of God. And I will place upon your finger the seal of sonship for eternity. My precious spirit will be upon you And I will clothe you in my majesty and my splendor. And I will say these words to you, my son. I am proud of you. I am proud of you. Receive it. Receive the Father's love. I love you, Father. 
Say those words, man. I love you, Father. Father, you have a perfect love for me. Say those words, man. Father, you have a perfect love for me. For I am your son, and you are my father. It's washing over you. I just see, you know, I just see like the Father just cleansing right now. He's just cleansing. Like Jesus washed feet. I just, I, I see the Lord cleansing our thoughts. He's washing away our thoughts of inadequacy. What if people find out my weakness? What if people really find out the flaws? the weaknesses of my heart and character. I see the Lord washing that away because your, your life is now His. Your virtue comes from Him. Your character has been reformed by the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now you are clean. Now you are His. And I want to invite any one of the men that are here. If you do not know Jesus Christ as the expression of the Father, the love gift of your Father, as the Savior of all mankind, as your best friend, your, your Savior and lover, then I want you to come to know Him right now. So we're going to pray this prayer, men, even though you may have prayed it before. I'm going to pray for the ladies in just a moment. My wife and I are going to pray for the gals. But men, even if you've prayed this before, if you've prayed it a hundred times, you're going to pray it a hundred and one times tonight. Put your hand over your heart. Say it with me out loud. Father, thank you for giving me a Savior, Jesus Christ, my Lord. I receive him into my life. Come into my heart tonight. Wash away all of my sins. And I want to know fully that I am your son, that I belong to you. I don't belong to my job. I really don't even belong to this earth. I belong to you. I receive you, Father. I receive you, Jesus Christ. I receive you, Holy Spirit. I am now your son by faith in the blood of Jesus that has made me clean. Thank you, Father. You are a perfect Father. Thank you, Lord. Whew. Guys, you think you could uh, make your way back, please? And I'm going to ask my wife to come, and I'm going to ask all of our wonderful sisters if you would come up, please. Thank you for letting me uh, lead the men in this way. In no way am I trying to make a distinction or to separate us in any, in any fashion. I just wanted to be able to pray for the men. Thank you, ladies. Come on up, gals. We're going to prophesy and I want you to hear the Father's words over you, the Father's heart for you, what the Father says about you. Because a Father is the one who gives us our name. He gives us our identity. And so many of us have been shaped, haven't we, men and women, we've been shaped by our fathers. And God has designed that so. But there is a relationship with a Father that is perfect unlike the very uh, tenuous and at times tension-filled relationship you may have had with your earthly father. There is a perfection and a satisfaction in your relationship with a heavenly father. He cherishes you. 
He finds delight in you. You never have to try to do anything to make him love you. Not one thing. If you were to say, God, why do you love me? He'd say, because. And then he lets you fill in the blank. I know what the Father really loves about you. Can I tell you? He told me. In an amazing encounter once, he told me what he really loves about you. Everything. Isn't that amazing? He loves everything about you. Close your eyes and listen to the Father's heart. My beautiful daughter, I am the one who has formed you and I created you for myself. I made you out of love. I put your body, soul, and spirit together. And I formed you in the hidden place. I was the one that gave you birth. I chose your mother. I chose your father. My hand has been upon your life from the moment you were conceived. I call you my cherished one, my beautiful one. And I love everything about you, for I am your father, and you are my daughter. I will never leave you. I will not allow you to move away from me. I have set my love upon you. Even now, I am blowing away the enemy's lies off of your thoughts, off of your heart and emotions. For I call you my radiant one, my cherished daughter. I love you. I am proud of you. Look at what you have become. For I have helped you. Even when you thought you made the wrong decision, I have helped you find your way back to me. For you are my chosen, my beloved, my favorite one, my daughter. daughter how beautiful you are to me oh how beautiful I saw you at the very beginning the first step that you took I was there and when you fall you reach for me to get up and I love the way that you seek me when others would turn away there you are seeking my face always looking to see where I am in the midst of your tears you're seeking for me to come And I'm there. I'm always with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you because you're my precious daughter. And I love everything about you. You're just so precious to me. I love the way you pray to me. I love the way you call out to me. I hear every cry and I see every tear. I will never forget you, my lovely daughter. I'm always there for you. Whenever you need me, just turn and there I am. I will never leave or forsake you because I love you with an everlasting love that will never fade away. You are my precious daughter and I love you. Now as a prophetic act, I'm gonna ask the men to come and stand behind all the women. Thank you guys. We won't keep you long. I'm just about done. I just want to close in prayer, but I want our sisters to know that mature sons of God are rising in the house. And as they mature as mature daughters, 
mature daughters are going to rise in this house. Filled, secure, strengthened by love. We're going to see this nation changed. We're going to see Connecticut transformed. And an awakening is coming, bro. I'm telling you. You don't have faith? Take some of mine. I got enough faith for this. I know it's going to happen. You're never going to, you're going to have to pry that promise out of my cold, dead hand. <laughs> Man, the fire of God just landed in my hand right now when I said that. Woo! My hot, burning hand, I should say. So, men and women, if you could just lift your hands to the Father right now. I just want to speak a benediction over you. And uh, this will be our, our conclusion tomorrow night. Keep your hands up as you, long as you can. Tomorrow night, I'm going to speak on the seven spirits of God. I'm going to pray seven times over everybody. It's going to be an amazing night. You'll never have a night like it tomorrow night. It will be the most incredible meeting. I'm prophesying to you. Something's going to happen as we release the seven mantles, the seven anointings, the seven spirits of God upon Harvest Time Church. So, Father, smile. Let your smile, whew, let the joy and the effervescence of your celebrating love, the rejoicing of sons and daughters that have come back to the Father's house, let it be released. Let it be released here. The joy of the Lord. And I say to the sisters that if there are any of you that have never received Jesus Christ, this is the night. I prayed with the men. I want to pray quickly with you. If you've never received Jesus Christ in your heart, this is the night for you to be one of his daughters, the daughters of Zion. All you do is open your heart and say these words with me. Dear Father, I need you. Say it with me, sisters. I need to know a father's love. And I need to know my sins are forgiven. Come into my heart. Lord Jesus, sent from the Father to be my Savior and to cleanse me from all my sin. I receive you into my heart and I take you as my very own. Give me greater confidence to know that I am your daughter. For I've asked these things in Jesus' name. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, by the triune essence of glory, by those threefold streams of blessing and love, you will be filled as you leave this house. You will enjoy the Father's love. You will not only receive it, but you will enjoy it as the greatest gift eternity can give you. So by the name and authority of Christ Jesus our Lord, go with the Father's peace, the Father's kiss, and the Father's love. And you may now hug your friend. In Jesus' name. We'll see you tomorrow night. God bless you. Don't forget to stop at the book table on your way out. Seven spirits of God like torches burning before the throne.